Water is life here in New Mexico, and without water, we don't have our traditional communities, we don't have our cities, we don't have agriculture, and we don't have a future in this state. The water's coming right now, so it's gonna be pretty crazy. Let me see if I can jump in here and start to clean up this track. It's important to remember how that water, or the lack of it, impacts all of us. Now we're gonna run it down the mother ditch to the compuertas where it divides, huh? We have the acequias up north that divert a small amount of water to the fields so they can grow their fields. Farming communities which had sustainable agricultural practices. We started this cleanup a little bit over a week ago, cleaning all the shrubs coming through and cleaning out the big pockets of sand and big piles of leaves. And then you can see how nice it looks now. My mom would always tell me in 1955, the Santa Cruz River dried up and they had to go down to the Rio Grande and haul water in barrels in the carts to come and put a cup of water on each plant. But we always have to be able to adapt to the changing environment, the changing weather patterns. And this is part of what we're doing. The people survive 400 years because they're able to change to what needs to be done to survive. One of the things that scientists have been telling us for a long time about climate change is we're going to see less snowpack, snowpack further north, and an earlier spring melt. We see that exactly this year. If temperatures increase uh, by three, four, five degrees, even seven degrees per century, the effect of that on snowpack in the southwest will be dire. We expect to see very little snowpack at all by the end of the century south of the Sangre de Cristos. And in the headwaters of major rivers in southern Colorado, we expect snowpack declines of 50% or thereabouts. It'll come off early, it'll dissipate quickly. We won't have the flows in the river for the farmers, for our agriculture, but also for all the wildlife that lives up and down this river. When we're thinking about protecting communities, protecting health, and protecting the environment, it's so important to understand the way that different natural resources are linked together. The integrity of the landscapes and the habitat is everything. If we don't have big tracts of very healthy, vibrant habitat, elk, mule, mule deer, bighorn sheep, their numbers suffer tremendously. So in the 21st century in New Mexico, it's been dry, and we use the word drought to describe it, but really this is kind of a permanent new state of affairs. We have less water, we can expect that going forward. Climate change reduces the available water supply, and increases the evaporation, or snow melts off and evaporates sooner. Climate change is really bad for our water supply. This farm is a farm I've been tending for 40 some years now. And right now we're in the middle of the hottest and the driest winter I've ever seen here. Unless the weather really changes, unless we get a lot of snow in February and, and March, um, we're gonna have hell to pay this summer in fire, bark beetles, irrigation water shortage, and drought stress and heat stress generally. It's always a mistake to confuse weather with climate, but these kinds of conditions are exactly what we expect here in the Southwest with climate change. We're looking at a hotter and drier future because of climate change, because of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and because of fossil fuel consumption. No two ways about it, the science is clear. There's no doubt that the temperature is getting warmer across the Southwest. We can show with um, standard temperature records that the temperature averaged over the state of New Mexico over the entire year is about three degrees warmer now than it was 40 years ago on average. The temperature at the Earth's surface depends on a couple of different things. The Earth is heated by the sun, but it's also heated 
from heat that's absorbed by the atmosphere and re-radiated back down. And that depends on greenhouse gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. They all contribute in known ways to keeping the Earth's surface warm. So when we increase the concentration of greenhouse gases, as we know is happening because we can measure it, there really is nothing else that can happen to the temperature other than, on average, the temperature goes up. Because of these trends, there will be significant declines in the average flow of major rivers like the Rio Grande. That potentially represents a major challenge for irrigated agriculture, which depends heavily on supplies of Rio Grande river water throughout the state. This muddy river here feeds all the people, all the wildlife here in New Mexico. Well, we don't have a snowpack, we have an early runoff. These coyotes that we saw, these ducks, these deer, this is their home, they live here. Their home's gone. Climate change is the symptom of our disconnectedness with one another, with the natural world, and uh, a preoccupation with a throwaway culture. I've noticed the justice elements with climate change. The most economically challenged would suffer the most in the future and would not have water. Social justice and environmentalism go hand in hand, and it's about caring for God's people, and it's about caring for God's creation. Our region, the Southwest, has always had drought. But what's going to be different in the future is that the droughts of the future are going to be crueler and tougher than those of the past, because the weather's going to be hotter. And hotter means more evaporation. And not even the United States Congress can repeal the law of evaporation. A little increase in temperature produces a big increase in evaporative force. And that means that the stress on all these trees, these grasses, everything around here is going to go up and up and up with the increased evaporation of the hotter future. And that's what partly guarantees us the future catastrophe of fire. I'm Tom Swetnam, and uh, I was born here in New Mexico. I'm a native New Mexican, and I live here in the Hamas Mountains. I grew up here in these forests, watching them change over the last 50 years. Las Conchas fire started right at the base of that mountain over there. And it was hot and dry, really hot, dry year in 2011, and the wind was blowing. And within an hour or so, that fire had raged up that mountain slope and burned over the top of the mountain. And there were 500 to 800 foot tall flames coming off the tops of those trees at the very top there. So five or six times the height of those trees. It was like a whirlwind, a cloud of smoke spinning and at the bottom flames coming up. And so this thing was moving faster than your usual fire. I mean, it just roared down the mesa tops and burned at a severity level that we haven't seen before on this landscape. The Las Conchas fire was a fire of the new age, shaped by climate change, by the increased heat, the increased evaporation. In the first 14 hours of the Las Conchas fire, the fire consumed one acre every second. That added up to 40,000 acres in 14 hours. People in New Mexico, no firefighter, had ever seen a fire like that in New Mexico before. It's those kinds of phenomena that we can expect to have more of in the climate changed future. These are devastating to wildlife. 
they, not only did they destroy the habitat, they kill the wildlife. They kill what they eat, where they live. And then following that, when we do get rains, we have tremendous erosion and it, it just wipes out the, the landscape. In a lot of these areas, you're burning off the forest and you're losing the capacity for the forest to regenerate. Instead, we're getting back our shrubs and grasses. And then also, you see all the dead trees laying around. This is a lot of fuel. So this landscape will burn again. And that's what's happening here in the Hamas Mountains and elsewhere in the Southwest. We're not just burning once, we're burning twice or three times over the same landscape. So climate change is driving the fires in the first place, and it's also inhibiting the forest from regenerating in these landscapes. Methane uh, emissions are a significant contributor in the short term to climate change. About a quarter of uh, the, the climate change that we're already experiencing is directly attributable to methane pollution. Methane's a huge problem. It's a potent greenhouse gas. And so what we need to do when you look at the oil and gas industry and the leakage of methane is make sure to keep that to a minimum. It's a very simple idea. I mean, basically what we're talking about is waste. You could heat the entire city of Chicago with the methane that has been wasted. We were identified as the methane hotspot of the United States, a methane hotspot the size of Delaware hovering above the Four Corners region. The topography and the mountains are there and they're going to stay there. The, the winds are not going to change. The only control you have to reduce the hotspot and the pollution are the emissions. If we don't become better stewards for the planet that we live on, um, some of the fundamental systems may indeed break down. I think that we all have a responsibility to take on climate change, but especially those of us in the United States and myself and my family, we have to own up to the fact that we have a larger carbon footprint than a lot of other people in the rest of the world especially, and that we have to recognize that our impact on the environment has been uh, overwhelmingly negative in the last couple of years, and we need to own up to that and start making steps to improve it. Under the current administration, it's given New Mexico more responsibility to take action and be a leader as a state and hopefully influence the entire country. So what I would like to see personally is a move away from treating a changing climate as a political issue and start to think about technological, practical solutions to managing it. What worries me most about climate change is that it's not an accepted issue you know, with a lot of people. The fact that it's debated causes a lot of problems and we really just need to work towards a goal to fix it instead of arguing whether it's real. If we think like engineers and scientists, we can deal with this. If we get mired in political debates uh, over nonsense, then we're wasting time. And I think that if we don't take really good care of these things and we get into these giant drought cycles and these giant wildfire fire cycles, I think 50 and 100 years from now, we're gonna see catastrophic impacts to these really, really critical resources and, and, and landscape and water systems. And it's up to us as generational stewards of these resources to make sure that our children have something that they can physically live in. Despite all of these problems, I actually do have some hope for the future, and that comes from seeing our young people in New Mexico who understand climate change probably better than most adults do, and who are thinking about real solutions for the future and not just doing things the same way that we've been doing it for generations. Sometimes we're not recognized. However, in this day and age, when teenagers are more than ever being recognized for their political actions, I think that there's a really real possibility that people like us can help influence our government. I'm really hopeful that our generation is united on this issue and that we're not separated by our backgrounds. We all know that climate change is a huge issue and that we all have to come together and work together to solve it. People ask me fairly often whether I am hopeful and I give that question a lot of thought but in the end I think it's the wrong question. The, the question should not be are you hopeful the question should be, what are you going to do next? What is your plan? How are you gonna help? 
everybody needs to put their shoulder to the problem and push as hard as they can. So can we just come together, fix our future, take these problems, find solutions, this is dire, we'll get through this, find the fire, we can do this. We can do this. Thus, on that eventful day of August 27th, 1859, Edwin Drake and his associates ushered in a new era. It had now been shown that oil in substantial quantities could be obtained by drilling. What are the positives of oil and gas? It's created the way of life that every American enjoys today. I don't think there's any doubt that the oil and gas industry has provided uh, jobs uh, to New Mexico in a significant way. It's a finite resource. Everybody gets that. Um, we have a, we're a wash in it now because of this technology boom. And I mean, and that's American ingenuity, you know. And I don't think it's anything. From where I sit and stand, I, I think I'm proud of, of what a lot of people in our industry have done and what we've allowed you know, uh, our country to be. Oil and gas has been a significant part of the New Mexico economy almost from the beginnings of the industry in the state, and that would have been 1924. Certainly by the 1940s, it was a major part of the economy, and we now depend on it very heavily. The energy sector is a major contributor to these United States. And you start getting into regions and, and very specific basins, uh, and you're going to see the benefits in terms of uh, revenues uh, by large corporations um, who are active in those uh, basins and those regions, uh, from the tax and from the royalty and from donations and, and from job creation. We still have uh, 75 to 100 employees. It's still a good place to be in the oil and gas industry. Uh, in uh, southeast New Mexico. You look at the uh, communities uh, the, up in the northwest and the southeast, uh, they're booming in many cases when the other parts of the state aren't. You know, the oil and gas industry really growing up brought me my heroes, the people that I grew up with and looked up to, and their can-do attitudes, what they could do, how they you know, brought the field to life. And, dealt with all the challenges. There was so much to learn from them. And we can't deny that as part of our history. It hasn't worked out in the long run exactly like a fairy tale, but what does? How did New Mexico become uh, so tied to the oil and gas business, I guess is the main thing, or the extractive industries? Um, uh, I guess it's because there used to be an ancient sea that flowed through here, and uh, that's what it left us. It may be hard to imagine today, but at one point, the state was the bottom of the ocean. And so this ancient sea left behind all kinds of organic matter that got buried and over time uh, turned into oil and gas deposits. In the northwest part of the state, that's primarily natural gas. And it's one of the country's biggest natural gas basins uh, in terms of production. In the southeast corner of the state, that deposit is primarily oil, although there's a significant amount of natural gas um, associated with it as well. We have two just marvelous basins, uh, the San Juan Basin and the Permian Basin. At, 
uh, different ends of the state. And those basins have been tremendously productive over time. New Mexico produces a great deal of oil and gas for the size of a state we are. In 1970, we reached a peak at 126 million barrels a, a year. In 2016, we produced 146 million barrels a year. And in 2017, it's right at 170 million barrels a year. So production is not only uh, continued, it's continued to increase, especially in recent years. In the beginning, uh, dating back to the, the Civil War actually, uh, fracking was done using explosives. And uh, they basically sent explosives down straight into the well and exploded them to try to get more oil and gas out of the rocks. And it worked that way for quite some time. I mean, we've been hydraulic fracturing wells for years. That is nothing new. There's been a well hydraulically you know, being fracked somewhere in the United States 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last 50 years. But what's new is the horizontal drilling, which actually is, has been going on for a while too, but it's the combination of the two. What's different and what's new is that there's been a combination of new technology with increased hydraulic fracking. And it has changed the ball game because now people can go into these organic rich shales and they can drill horizontally uh, a mile, sometimes two miles, and then blast it with high pressure water and chemicals and extract the, the, the gas that way. And that's changing the oil and gas business because it's a very low risk type of a thing as far as hitting commercial hydrocarbons. If we were still taking as long to drill a well and had the primitive ways of uh, producing a well that we had say 75 years ago, uh, I don't know what the price of gasoline would be, maybe $20 a gallon. We just wouldn't be able to, to afford to, to uh, use it for transportation or uh, generating electricity or anything. People wouldn't have the conveniences that they do uh, because of the, the technology and, and the advancement that the oil and gas industry have made. So in some ways, um, the, the, the uh, price crash in uh, natural gas uh, that's led to a lot of uh, economic problems in New Mexico's San Juan Basin. It's really uh, a problem of, of the oil and gas industry being a victim of its own success in some ways. That overproduction uh, led to a decrease in prices. It's just plain old economics of supply and demand. The San Juan Basin produces mainly gas, natural gas, not oil. And the price of natural gas is very low. And so there's no real boom in the San Juan Basin. In fact, Farmington, which is the biggest city in San Juan County, has been losing population and losing jobs. Uh, and it is because of the low price of natural gas. Like all other industries, um, we're doing it with less and less people all the time, even in oil and gas. You know, we've lost about 6,500 jobs in oil and gas alone. And that will never come back because even if we were operating the 30 or 40 rigs that we used to, they're doing it with about half the people that they used to now. Uh, so everything we're doing is far more efficient than it used to be. So New Mexico's economy is struggling right now. Um, the one sector of our economy that's doing extremely well is oil and gas production. Um, oil and gas is, our production of oil and gas is at record levels. But the employment in oil and gas is not going up as fast as oil production because the drillers are getting more efficient using technology, automation in their systems. So you see the oil production going way up and the jobs are not quite going up. And so, you know, I worry that we're not getting the sort of economic benefit out of oil and gas that you would think we would if you look at our production numbers. I think we've seen a, a significant boom and bust cycle. You know, when oil price is high, uh, the state's doing well, the revenue for the state is coming in. Uh, when it is low, uh, we, we're, we're in bad shape and everybody starts fighting because we don't have enough in terms of revenue. Oil prices are not 
sky high like they were a few years ago, but they're high enough that it's leading to a big boom in, in the oil development in, in southeastern New Mexico's Permian Basin. The, the Permian Basin is booming right now. The price of oil has gone from $20 a barrel, $26 a barrel in 2016, to $65 a barrel uh, today. If you go back, oh, about 40 years now, half of the revenue for the state of New Mexico was from oil and gas. Just a few weeks ago, we were projecting a $200 million budget surplus. Now it has already grown to over $330 million. Maybe we should give a big chunk of that back to the taxpayers. The current budget situation shows that we have a little over $300 million in what is called new money. New money is the difference between last year's state appropriations and the revenue estimates for the coming year. It is entirely dependent on the recovery in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I think it'll probably last through the next fiscal year, but it could disappear in an instant. We are more dependent on oil and gas revenues because a very large portion of the state budget is funded through the oil and gas industry. One of the things that we've done to make it even worse is we've adopted this tax cut to prosperity model that clearly has not worked. And by that I mean we've offered large corporate income tax cuts, we've offered large personal income tax cuts, in the hope that that will somehow mean a vibrant economy. That hasn't worked. It's been a terrible failure. And because of that, our state general fund continues to struggle, which means we don't have the dollars to invest in our K-12 education system. There's no doubt that the oil and gas industry has benefited New Mexico, but those benefits have come with a cost. And there's been cost to our communities, to our wildlife, to our culture, and to our landscape. And going forward, we have to weigh those costs against the benefits that the industry provides. It should be the goal of everyone involved to, be, to, to establish good relationships. And moving forward, we should establish a good relationship between the industry and the people of the state of New Mexico. I guess what I'd like to see New Mexico is I think we have so many opportunities because of, of not just natural resources, the extractive industry, but we have so much beauty here and so many things to offer. I, I, think, I think we have the best of everything if we can manage it right, if we come together and, and have agreements on, on how best to develop the recreation, the tourism, the natural resources that we have. You know, we, we have everything we need to be an extremely successful state. Water is life here in New Mexico, and without water we don't have our traditional communities, we don't have our cities, we don't have agriculture, and we don't have a future in this state. 
The water's coming right now, so it's gonna be pretty crazy. Let me see if I can jump in here and start to clean up this track. It's important to remember how that water or the lack of it impacts all of us. Now we're gonna run it down the mother ditch to the compuertas where it divides, huh? We have the acequias up north that divert a small amount of water to the fields so they can grow their fields. Farming communities which had sustainable agricultural practices. We started this cleanup a little bit over a week ago, cleaning all the shrubs, coming through and cleaning out the big pockets of sand and big piles of leaves. And then you can see how nice it looks now. My mom would always tell me in 1955, the Santa Cruz River dried up and they had to go down to the Rio Grande and haul water in barrels in the carts to come and put a cup of water on each plant. But we always have to be able to adapt to the changing environment, the changing weather patterns. And this is part of what we're doing. The people survive 400 years because they're able to change to what needs to be done to survive. One of the things that scientists have been telling us for a long time about climate change is we're going to see less snowpack, snowpack further north, and an earlier spring melt. We see that exactly this year. If temperatures increase uh, by three, four, five degrees, even seven degrees per century, the effect of that on snowpack in the southwest will be dire. We expect to see very little snowpack at all by the end of the century south of the Sangre de Cristos. And in the headwaters of major rivers in southern Colorado, we expect snowpack declines of 50% or thereabouts. It'll come off early. It'll dissipate quickly. We won't have the flows in the river for the farmers, for our agriculture, but also for all the wildlife that lives up and down this river. When we're thinking about protecting communities, protecting health, and protecting the environment, it's so important to understand the way that different natural resources are linked together. The integrity of the landscapes and the habitat is everything. If we don't have big tracts of very healthy, vibrant habitat, elk, mule, mule deer, bighorn sheep, their numbers suffer tremendously. So in the 21st century in New Mexico, it's been dry, and we use the word drought to describe it, but really this is kind of a permanent new state of affairs. We have less water, we can expect that going forward. Climate change reduces the available water supply, it increases the evaporation, or snow melts off and evaporates sooner. Climate change is really bad for our water supply. This farm is a farm I've been tending for 40 some years now. And right now we're in the middle of the hottest and the driest winter I've ever seen here. Unless the weather really changes, unless we get a lot of snow in February and, and March, um, we're gonna have hell to pay this summer in fire, bark beetles, irrigation water shortage, and drought stress and heat stress generally. It's always a mistake to confuse weather with climate, but these kinds of conditions are exactly what we expect here in the Southwest with climate change. We're looking at a hotter and drier future because of climate change, because of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and because of fossil fuel consumption. No two ways about it, the science is clear. There's no doubt that the temperature is getting warmer across the Southwest. We can show with um, standard temperature records that the temperature averaged over the state of New Mexico over the entire year is about three degrees warmer now than it was 40 years ago on average. The temperature at the Earth's surface depends on a couple of different things. The Earth is heated by the sun, but it's also heated from heat that's absorbed by the atmosphere and re-radiated back down. And that depends on greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. 
they all contribute in known ways to keeping the Earth's surface warm. So when we increase the concentration of greenhouse gases, as we know is happening because we can measure it, there really is nothing else that can happen to the temperature other than, on average, the temperature goes up. Because of these trends, there will be significant declines in the average flow of major rivers like the Rio Grande. That potentially represents a major challenge for irrigated agriculture, which depends heavily on supplies of Rio Grande river water throughout the state. This muddy river here feeds all the people, all the wildlife here in New Mexico. Well, we don't have a snowpack, and we have an early runoff. These coyotes that we saw, these ducks, these deer, this is their home, they live here. Their home's gone. Climate change is the symptom of our disconnectedness with one another, with the natural world, and uh, a preoccupation with a throwaway culture. I've noticed the justice elements with climate change. The most economically challenged would suffer the most in the future and would not have water. Social justice and environmentalism go hand in hand, and it's about caring for God's people, and it's about caring for God's creation. Our region, the Southwest, has always had drought. But what's gonna be different in the future is that the droughts of the future are gonna be crueler and tougher than those of the past because the weather's gonna be hotter. And hotter means more evaporation. And not even the United States Congress can repeal the law of evaporation. A little increase in temperature produces a big increase in evaporative force. And that means that the stress on all these trees, these grasses, everything around here is going to go up and up and up with the increased evaporation of the hotter future. And that's what partly guarantees us the future catastrophe of fire. I'm Tom Swetnam, and uh, I was born here in New Mexico. I'm a native New Mexican, and I live here in the Hamas Mountains. I grew up here in these forests, watching them change over the last 50 years. Las Conchas fire started right at the base of that mountain over there, and it was hot and dry, a really hot, dry year in 2011, and the wind was blowing, and within an hour or so, that fire had raged up that mountain slope and burned over the top of the mountain, and there were 500 to 800 foot tall flames coming off the tops of those trees at the very top there, so five or six times the height of those trees. It was like a whirlwind, a cloud of smoke spinning and at the bottom flames coming up. And so this thing was moving faster than your usual fire. I mean, it just roared down the mesa tops and burned at a severity level that we hadn't seen before on this landscape. The Las Conchas fire was a fire of the new age shaped by climate change, by the increased heat, the increased evaporation. In the first 14 hours of the Las Conchas fire, the fire consumed one acre every second. That added up to 40,000 acres in 14 hours. People in New Mexico, no firefighter, had ever seen a fire like that in New Mexico before. It's those kinds of phenomena that we can expect to have more of in the climate changed future. These are devastating to wildlife. They, not only do they destroy the habitat, they kill the wildlife. They kill what they eat, where they live. And then following that, when we do get rains, we have tremendous erosion and it, it just wipes out the, the landscape. In a lot of these areas, 
you're burning off the forest and you're losing the capacity for the forest to regenerate. Instead, what we're getting back are shrubs and grasses. And then also, you see all the dead trees laying around. This is a lot of fuel. So this landscape will burn again. And that's what's happening here in the Hamas Mountains and elsewhere in the Southwest. We're not just burning once, we're burning twice or three times over the same landscape. So climate change is driving the fires in the first place, and it's also inhibiting the forest from regenerating in these landscapes. Methane uh, emissions are a significant contributor in the short term to climate change. About a quarter of uh, the, the climate change that we're already experiencing is directly attributable to methane pollution. Methane's a huge problem. It's a potent greenhouse gas. And so what we need to do when you look at the oil and gas industry and the leakage of methane is make sure to keep that to a minimum. It's a very simple idea. I mean, basically what we're talking about is waste. You could heat the entire city of Chicago with the methane that has been wasted. We were identified as the methane hotspot of the United States, a methane hotspot the size of Delaware hovering above the Four Corners region. The topography and the mountains are there and they're going to stay there. The, the winds are not going to change. The only control you have to reduce the hotspot and the pollution are the emissions. If we don't become better stewards for the planet that we live on, um, some of the fundamental systems may indeed break down. I think that we all have a responsibility to take on climate change, but especially those of us in the United States and myself and my family, we have to own up to the fact that we have a larger carbon footprint than a lot of other people in the rest of the world especially, and that we have to recognize that our impact on the environment has been uh, overwhelmingly negative in the last couple of years, and we need to own up to that and start making steps to improve it. Under the current administration, it's given New Mexico more responsibility to take action and be a leader as a state and hopefully influence the entire country. So what I would like to see personally is a move away from treating a changing climate as a political issue and start to think about technological, practical solutions to managing it. What worries me most about climate change is that it's not an accepted issue you know, with a lot of people. The fact that it's debated causes a lot of problems and we really just need to work towards a goal to fix it instead of arguing whether it's real. If we think like engineers and scientists, we can deal with this. If we get mired in political debates uh, over nonsense, then we're wasting time. And I think that if we don't take really good care of these things and we get into these giant drought cycles and these giant wildfire fire cycles, I think 50 and 100 years from now, we're gonna see catastrophic impacts to these really, really critical resources and, and, and landscape and water systems. And it's up to us as generational stewards of these resources to make sure that our children have something that they can physically live in. Despite all of these problems, I actually do have some hope for the future, and that comes from seeing our young people in New Mexico who understand climate change probably better than most adults do, and who are thinking about real solutions for the future and not just doing things the same way that we've been doing it for generations. Sometimes we're not recognized. However, in this day and age, when teenagers are more than ever being recognized for their political actions, I think that there's a really real possibility that people like us can help influence our government. I'm really hopeful that our generation is united on this issue and that we're not separated by our backgrounds. We all know that climate change is a huge issue and that we all have to come together and work together to solve it. People ask me fairly often whether I am hopeful and I give that question a lot of thought but in the end I think it's the wrong question. The, the question should not be are you hopeful the question should be, what are you going to do next? What is your plan? How are you gonna help? Everybody needs to put their shoulder to the problem and push as hard as they can. So can we just come together, fix our future, take the
So, um, speaking of something political, we have here today our mayor of Albuquerque um, to come and speak about his thoughts about this project and um, where the state is um, from his vast experience as previous auditor and now here running the largest city in New Mexico. So, for Mayor Tim Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, Albuquerque, and also folks from around the state who've gathered here tonight for this. Uh, what Was that an awesome video or what? Yeah. That was really good. Excellent job, you guys. Can you and, play it at the airport? <laughs> I love it. You know, um, so uh, that is a great question. Can we play it at the airport? I have no idea. Um, yeah, good question. We can check on it. And the good news is one of our panelists is our chief of staff, Sunali Stewart. He'd probably be the one to check on that. Uh, but it's a good idea, and there might be some other areas where we can view it as well. But I also want to let folks know that uh, we are recording this for our channel 16. So I want to give a plug to Government TV. It's our own C-SPAN. And uh, you should all watch all the time. It's riveting. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but we are going to be airing it for sure on Channel 16. Um, and actually, by the way, Channel 16 will surprise you. They have some great programs. And I believe it's much more exciting than C-SPAN. So a couple of things that I'll just share with you. I think the video did a great job of, of you know, setting that narrative in a way that I could never do that only our uh, gifted storytellers can. So I just will, I think, maybe color this with a little bit of backdrop from my experience working on this issue. You know, number one is that when I started a, a mere 10 years ago in, in politics as a state senator, uh, I discovered this notion of our sort of tax whole program, our tax regimen, our tax policy, and where we manipulate essentially how much money we take out of your wallet and uh, where we put it. And when you dive into this, I think we discover, and what came out in the videos, we discover there's all these bizarre inequities that show up, and frankly, injustices in many ways, that actually uh, are something that is, that is bipartisanly despised. So we have built a system of taxation and then spending that even on an individual basis, most of our legislators and most of our governors would agree is deeply flawed and deeply inconsistent. Yet we continue to do it year after year after year. Now, of course, the prime example of this is this notion that we do tax our extractive industries through the royalty process, of course, but we sort of decide not to collect that on a whole host of issues. And I'm not going to talk about tax policy in detail here, but there are all these loopholes when it comes to actually royalties and collections. And so the irony is, while we say that this is how we deal with our uh, inherent natural resources, how we act is actually a little bit different. We actually, we actually take royalties on a lot less than is on paper because of all these different loopholes. Now, we see this also on the other end in terms of we have needs and resources in our state, right? Because the whole concept, the whole bargain of the New Mexico tax code is that we, we are allowing our natural resources to be used, but that, was, that use is supposed to be for our public good, for public schools, and so forth. And so fundamentally, this is a challenge that many states have, and also New Mexico has, because we are violating that bargain. That contract does not hold true. And the most egregious example of that is, of course, this notion of methane flaring and how methane is just completely off the grid when it comes to this agreement that we made, whether we like it or not, at the foundation of statehood. And of course, you know, there's a whole backdrop to that agreement, but that's like, that's for volume two, three, and four. Um, but I want to highlight this because I think when we talk about this individually, again, people think it doesn't make sense. 
but we've got to get the collective will to actually change it. And that's why this project is so important. People have got to understand that we are doing things that are completely inconsistent with, I believe, our values, even if you're a fiscal conservative. And so, uh, anyway, that to me is the fundamental thing. That is the fundamental challenge of governing New Mexico. And as state auditor, this is where I really saw this, and I think some of this comes out in the video, but the notion of when you actually get behind the dollars that are at stake, we're talking about like tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars that we are actually at stake here in sharp contrast to those numbers like 47th in education or 50th in education or last in poverty and then you know top in resources so these kinds of disconnects i think highlight one the fundamental challenge with New Mexico going forward, that structural imbalance of the agreement that makes us work as a state and funds everything that we need, but also the solution. The solution is actually not as hard as we think. If we actually can stand up for environmental justice and for fiscal responsibility, I mean, the amazing thing is that is the majority of the population and then some, we can solve both these problems at the same time. So, it doesn't nearly scratch the surface when it comes to things like climate change and so forth, but I just want to leave with you, there is a grand bargain in New Mexico around natural resources, and it's this very notion, this very contradiction. So let me close with now my new role as uh, mayor of the city of Albuquerque. Uh, unfortunately, one of the few things is I'm a lot less involved in this issue, fundamentally at the state level, of course, but I get the chance to try and work on this at the city level. And so I'm thrilled to share that we have made, I think, a little bit of progress. One, we signed on the Paris Accords. Big step for our city. Thank you. Two, we announced yesterday that we are spending $25 million to get us hopefully to 25% renewables by the year 2025. That's awesome and we're on our way. And it's in formation, we have the pieces of it, but we are going to be creating Albuquerque's first ever Office of Sustainability that is going to work on all of these projects and will be transparent and accountable to the public. So we are going to try and lead with action by doing the things that I just mentioned, but also having essentially a bureau that's gonna work on this for however long I'm lucky enough to be our mayor. And that down the road, hopefully we'll see things like distributed generation. We'll also see policy coming out that protects us from the dangers with respect to fracking and other things. And so we are finally in our uh, city, I believe, over the course of the next couple of years, going to have an office to deal with environmental justice issues and climate change and renewable energies and fiscal responsibility with respect to our electricity bill, which right now we are the largest electricity payer in the state of New Mexico. So by saving money on that, we are saving money even in our budget on the bottom line. So we're going to try and demonstrate this over the next four years or however long we can and say that there is a path forward and hopefully we'll be able to bring the state and all the other cities along with us. So that's the game plan in Albuquerque. Now, thank you. <laughs> So I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up and just share uh, this. There are other areas that are tangentially related, like our use of plastics and uh, recycling programs. These are all things we're going to start working on at the city. And we're actually starting with our farmers markets and trying to take plastics out of our farmers markets. It's going to take a community effort coming together as one Albuquerque, nonprofits, businesses, et cetera, in a program that we can hopefully over time incentivize. And then uh, we have a whole long path ahead of us when it comes to actual recycling, especially with businesses. And so the good news, we're sort of you know one foot in the door on these, or we're on first base, and we're going to keep going all the way around. And so I'm excited to share with you what comes next. But in the meantime, let me end with this. We have to get the message out that Kabu shared with us tonight. And I know everyone in this room understands that and everyone knows that. But to me, the call to action is to spread this narrative, spread this message in each of our respective ways, whether it's parts of indivisible groups or parts of the nasty women or parts of environmental justice groups. Um, 
everyone, I think, has a responsibility to share this message. And so that's also why I wanted to be here tonight, because as mayor, I will also be sharing this message. But we need to share this far and wide across the state and across our country so that this story is told in all aspects of it, including the story, the perspective from, of course, our Native American folks, and it's great that we're doing this here, uh, our indigenous communities, and uh, all the way through the spectrum to the business side of that story. We need to share that in every part of our community and our society. So that's what I hope we'll do going forward. So with that, thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to our, for our panel up next. Thank you. So now, without further ado, um, I'd like to um, introduce our esteemed uh, moderator, Tara Gatewood, um, who is a veteran journalist at KUNM. Tara? Um, and we have uh, many uh, fine panelists, including Kent Salazar. Kent comes to us um, as a member of ECHO, um, Hispanics enjoying um, camping, hunting in the outdoors, as well as um, a board member of the um, National Wildlife Federation. Um, Phoebe Sueña, thank you. Phoebe comes with us from Chicago. Uh, thank you, Phoebe. Um, and then we have Darian Cabral, who is from Coda Holdings and is an energy expert. Um, and we have Sunile Stewart um, uh, from the city of uh, um, from the um, uh, chief of staff to the mayor of Albuquerque. Um, and then uh, we also have Sister Joan Brown from New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you. Please thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I definitely want to say thanks again to Kavu for getting us to this point to start this discussion. And our panel today represents many different walks of life, especially some of the things that were represented uh, in each of the chapters. And so I think we're at a really special moment, being in this room together, being here in, in a central location of New Mexico, as well as the city. And I want to start off at that intersection that our mayor took us to, the balance between uh, the different roads that we come to. And I think just to giving a moment to see how much oil and gas has brought to our state for positive and negative. I think that's a great place for us to start. And I wanna go ahead and jump into the wealth that we do have here on the panel. And Sumale, I wanna call on you because you've definitely taken many paths um, in understanding our state of New Mexico. I just wanted to give you a moment to further express just how much um, you feel that oil and gas has brought to New Mexico. Does it work? Great. Well, first, let me say thank you for being here. It's a real uh, honor to be with everybody here to have this discussion. I, I think a couple of things that we need to remember. One is how our state got tied to oil and gas to begin with. Um, you know, we have a checkerboard of land in New Mexico, uh, federal, state, uh, and private land, and there are educational institutions that are tied to that land and all the revenue that is generated off of that land goes to support those educational institutions. So from our statehood, there has been this nexus between working lands, which in the Permian Basin have tended to be uh, oil and gas, um, and uh, money that goes to support education. But it doesn't always need to, to be like that. Uh, you know, right now our budget, about 30% uh, goes to, uh, from oil and gas. Um, but we really need to begin in terms of diversification, renewable energy, uh, and some of these other areas. But there's no doubt that historically uh, we've been tied uh, to this industry. It's created jobs. Uh, but as we heard, it's had a lot of adverse impacts. So we need to begin the process of transition. 
All right, thank you for that. And Kent, I want to turn to you. Uh, ECHO, the, the group that you are connected with, is really concerned about culture of New Mexico. And, and tell us more um, from a cultural perspective, your thoughts on just what oil and gas has brought to New Mexico. Well, for one thing, the Spanish in the state uh, have worked from the very beginning on some of these industries, on our extractive industries. We've been miners. You know, we've, we've worked oil and gas, we've done all that. So we're very much in favor of the, of the economics of jobs that are brought to us. But we're also faced with the fact that, that it also has negative impacts on our, on our culture. Uh, it's a waste, a waste of a resource that belongs to all of us. And that, that we, we don't take, we don't tolerate losing, uh, wasting food, wasting water. These are precious things to us. And so when we, we have industries that waste, it, it, it goes against what we are culturally uh, raised with. I think you saw some of the Asequia people living a very sustainable life with, with water and, and how they use the water very sparingly. And, and they talked about even carrying water for their plants. That's the type of, of ethic we, we need to share with our, our industries have to have that as well. This is, they can't be wasting this. It, there's technology that they don't have to, that they don't have to do this, and uh, and it's costing us a lot in terms of education for our children, our health. I like to say that there are a few things that all living things need: clean air, clean water, and a place to live. And and we're losing those when we're not capturing the methane. We're we're losing the clean air. We're endangering the water. And and for me, a big thing being a Hispanic that likes to hunt and fish is the, the, the habitat that's being uh, fragmented and degraded. And we charge industry to, to, to care for our lands when they have leases, that they will restore it. But traditionally, they have not. And I think that that's something that we need to hold them to as well, that when they finish a mine, that they, they restore it. When they take the coal out of the ground, they restore it. When they're drilling in our lands, that they capture and hold precious those resources that we have. Thank you for that. And I do want to let folks know that we are also recording today's discussion for Kavu podcast with Unearth. Uh, so if you also want to participate, we're definitely going to have a moment for questions and questions coming from our audience. And um, as we continue here, hearing these different voices, uh, and you want to catch up on any of the chapters or uh, connect with some of the ones that are be, that will be coming up. You can find them on the website, Kavu's website. So I just wanted to let you know that. And so, um, Darian, I wanted to turn to you when we talk about industry and the organization you're with it is kind of a middle person of helping people understand both sides. And when we think about more understanding of the needs of some of the things we've heard Kent talk about, as well as the needs to grow, any thoughts you'd like to add? Hello? OK. So um, I work with a small native-owned organization called Coda Holdings. And uh, Coda Holdings specializes in working with tribes on energy and economic development. And uh, you know, I speak to a lot of different people. Um, uh, in my work, and I often speak to people who are um, environmentally uh, astute, like most of you, I'm sure, and when I tell them I work with tribes, I work with renewable energy, uh, solar and wind, and so forth and so on, you know, they're thrilled to, wow, that's fantastic. But then I say, well, we also work with oil and gas tribes, and um, there are several very wealthy and adept oil and gas tribes around the country. And um, one thing that I'm really inspired about, and one reason I'm really happy to be here, is because CABU is one of the few organizations I've come across so far that recognizes that we have to bring people together, that we're way too polarized, and when people are arguing, nothing gets done, nothing happens. Um, we are entering the most polarized time that I've ever seen in this country. Um, you know, we're, we're facing scary issues, and um, people don't like to face scary issues. There's a lot of denial going on. 
Um, and so I think organizations like CAVU, you know, I was at a, not too long ago, one of their discussions where they had environmental people, and oil and gas industry people, um, and, they were, and, and they were talking to each other, not against each other, and finding common ground. And, and the um, uh, oil and gas is not going to go away soon. That's just reality. I mean, we all drive here in automobiles. Um, and to think that um, we're going to just turn off the, the, the spigot, you know, and, and, and stop taking oil and gas out of the ground is a fallacy. So if, uh, for example, uh, people are saying, well, why is this tribe drilling, you know, uh, for oil and gas, and, you know, they should be leaving it in the ground. Well, if they leave it in the ground in New Mexico, it's going to come out of the ground in Saudi Arabia or Russia or Iran or somewhere else because the demand is there. Um, so there's, there's a terrific book called uh, Last Days of Ancient Sunlight, which is what oil and gas is. Um, it's ancient energy that is from the sun that's been stored underground that we all live with and around. And yes, we're facing issues here, but there's, it's not black and white issues. There's a lot of irony. For example, um, the United States, and even I think with the present administration that we have, I believe the United States is going to come close to living up to the goals that we set um, for the Paris Accords. And the reason that's going to happen is because of fracking and because natural gas is taking the place of coal. Coal plants are shutting down so that um, pollution is diminishing. But it's because we're drilling, and it's because of we're, we're drilling for, for, for natural gas, and because the price of natural gas is much lower than coal. So it's, it's not a black and white issue. It's not an issue to be argued about. It's an issue to find common ground around. So um, I'm hoping that you know, Kavu and this effort can, can do that. And Phoebe, I'd like to turn to you, because the work that you're doing definitely is speaking about what happens when the environment changes. And your thoughts about hearing from the rest of the panel on how great dialogue needs to be happening. Anything you want to add about what you've witnessed and, and what happens when the Earth is changing as a result of some of the things we've presented? Well, um, I, I like to go back to, um, you know, our our Pueblo communities and how they discuss and make decisions. Many of our Pueblo communities do that by consensus. So you have, in many times, 40 plus elders, older men, trying to gain consensus on one issue um, to move forward, and it requires a lot of discussion. Uh, there are opposing views many times. But if we are respectful in our interactions and our discussions, we're able to work through those issues. Um, and, and so I just wanted to add that on to what Darian was saying. But in addition to it, um, what I've seen after the Los Conchas fire, after Sara Grande fire, after the Dome fire, and all in this, almost in the same footprint um, in the Hamas Mountain area. So what the, the, one of the gentlemen said on the video was that footprint, that fire footprint, burned three times in a few decades. So for the tribal communities, that's loss of resources, not just for one generation, not just for five years. I'm talking about my children's 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 may see that landscape back. And so um, as Darian said, is it's always a balance as well. How do we protect and steward our resources for this generation, for my generation? It's upon our responsibility to try to steward those resources for the next generations. But then we have economic pressures. How do we provide infrastructure, especially for tribal communities, which Darian works with a lot. And so there's always these competing forces. Um, I work with one Pueblo who almost every council meeting discusses, should we mine? No, there's 
there's a group over here that says, no, we want to steward those resources. Mining is not within our core values. But the tribe needs that monthly revenue in order to keep tribal programs open and services for the people. So it's, I think for the last six months, we've been discussing that particular issue. No firm decision yet, but it takes a lot of discussion. And I, and I would also like to echo is, as long as we keep discussing in a respectful manner, we're going to all come with our own perspectives. Um, but at some point, at least for tribal people uh, and Pueblo people, um, one of our elders once said, you know, as we throw our cornmeal with our hand, praying for our resources, the water, the air, our people, do we take money with that same hand? And so that choice is a constant pressure for our tribal leadership in particular, which ends up, you know, the extractive industry ends up impacting our communities and our ability to continue to steward and ensure those resources are there for our next generation. So I guess my whole point is it's just a continued discussion. Thank you. And let's continue speaking of people. And Sister Joan, I want to turn to you. Um, you definitely bring a lot of wealth to the panel today in the many places where you've witnessed um, impacts to communities. And, and paint that picture for us more about how some of these items connect directly to people and communities. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here and uh, for being with this panel. Um, you know, one thing that I'd like to just touch on, I've heard a number of times of the panelists, is that word steward and stewardship. And with faith communities, that's a very core value. And it comes from um, that um, guideline, law, rule in all traditions that we are to care for um, our neighbors as ourselves and to love our neighbors. And we've come to know in recent years even more so that those neighbors are the humans and the creatures and the water, as St. Francis of Assisi calls sister water, humble, precious, and pure. And so um, as a Franciscan, I, I have found myself in a variety of communities, like on the, the border and uh, New Mexico, where the Garden Light works all over the state um, with various communities. Um, concerned about water, about their livelihood, about economics, about um, struggling to discern. And it is what you were talking about, Phoebe, is discernment. And yeah, I think you were talking about that too. And, and we try to have um, part of our role in the community uh, as uh, people of faith is to be impartial. And we are. I mean, we're not of any vested interest. We are just trying to hold this moral, ethical place and have conversations around that. And certainly we do get heated and move over here and back and forth, but the ultimate goal is discernment and weighing those issues of, uh, for instance, I was, um, a, you know, about a month ago, I was in the southeast part of our state, which is growing in oil and gas with the Permian Basin, and I was talking to a pastor down there, and he was talking about the social concerns from um, this. I mean, people need work, but we're also learning that um, as we heard in the film, which was, I thought, a fascinating piece, that um, jobs or employment are not increasing with um, the, you know, increase in oil and gas in our, in our state because of technology and a variety of, of reasons. So, and he was talking about the poverty that they're facing, that people can't afford to um, pay for their rent because prices have gone up so dramatically because of people coming in, there's scarcity of housing. Um, the funerals he's had, because people have been in accidents, not their own of their own volition, but because some of the workers are stressed because they're driving long hours. Um, um, domestic violence calls that he's dealing with, and so, so it's like discerning this, the the economics of it and how that funds our um, part of our state education but the social elements as well, and then the ecological elements. And um, in the last couple of years, I've gone a lot to uh, Pope Francis's On Care of Our Common Home, that encyclical, which is uh, a marvelous document that he wrote for everybody. And it really is for everybody. And he talks about economic ecology. Don't you love that? And it's coming from both of those words, economic and ecology, 
come from the root word ego, which in Latin is oikos, which is about our home and relationships. So I think all of us here are talking about relationships, and that's what it's about, and how we discern, hold all of this complexity together, because we all love life, and we're all part of life, and how do we move into that in the, into the future? And I think this is a, a great moment to just kind of reflect a little bit on what we've heard on the panel. And I want to take it to a news segment, leave it to the journalist to take us straight to the news. Um, but as you're hearing from the different panelists, you see where their backgrounds are coming together. And I wanted to bring us to a recent report that came out uh, in the Journal of Science. And maybe uh, you've read it or people in, in our audience have read it. Um, and, and I'm going to look directly at the articles because I want to make sure that I'm giving you good numbers. Uh, they published a, a study not too long ago this month that the rate of methane emissions from domestic oil gas operations is about 60% higher than the current estimate from the Environmental Protection Agency. And we heard a lot of this discussion in the films, especially in chapter one, taking a look at this. And so it seems this story continues to grow too about venting and flaring. And let's reconnect to some of these spaces that the panel has opened up and our thoughts on how we make sense of this or how we understand more and how do we get to the bottom line of just how much is being emitted and, and really are there other ways we haven't thought of to consider some of this. And so I want to go ahead and, and start with you, Darian. Any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. And um, <laughs> one reason I'm here is because um, I do business plans for companies. And in 2015, I did a business plan for a company I'm not going to mention because I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of this company, but I'm going to tell you about the company. Um, I, I actually called the, uh, the, uh, one of the people that, uh, that owned the company and, and tried to get permission or, or have him come and, and, and talk about this company, but he wasn't available. Um, so uh, when I did this plan, um, I found out that this company they manufacture what's called midstream oil and gas equipment. It's things like dehydrators, um, um, separators, um, and if, you know, if there was oil and gas people here, they would tell me the full range. Um, and this equipment is uh, installed at the wellhead, and is what it does is it separates water, it separates hydrocarbon, it separates natural gas from oil, um, and uh, and uh, this company does this equipment, manufactures this equipment, sells this equipment, and um, all of their uh, equipment is zero emission. And the reason it's zero emission is because the gentleman that started the company um, was a genius. Um, we, we met him uh, when we started this plan. He lives, he lives in Farmington even though the company manufactures in Oklahoma. Um, and he figured out how to ma make this stuff and, and not uh, have it emit any methane whatsoever. Um, and it's the only company, I believe, it's when, we did, when we did the plan in 2015, in the world that is zero emission. And if you go on uh, the web and you look at zero emission, you look at the EPA site, um, uh, there's directives that talk about zero emission equipment and uh, uh, advocating the use of this. And they and EPA did an analysis. And uh, the only company that makes this stuff is this one, this one particular company. Uh, so the technology is there. Um, the company has been losing money ever since it started, about probably 15 years ago. It's been losing money since I did the business plan in 2015. Um, and it's, it's barely staying afloat right now, even though their equipment is in the, all the major oil basins, has been purchased by most of the major oil companies, and has been proven and tested. Um, and uh, the other significant thing about this company is that their equipment captures fugitive emissions 
and, and, and captures uh, vapors and so forth, puts it back into the production stream. Uh, they can eliminate flaring. Uh, and when it goes back into the production stream, uh, it actually pays for itself in within six months to two years. So there's no reason why uh, companies aren't buying it, using it, but they're, they're not. They, they, they are to a degree, but they're not. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because um, oil and gas people are used to doing things a certain way. They've always done it a certain way. And unless they are forced to do things through regulation differently, they won't. So when we did this business plan, it was when Obama was in office. Um, we were looking at Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper, uh, as, as a model because they passed regulation uh, to limit methane and, and emissions. And, and we were thinking, well, that's going to be a national model. Uh, that's coming next. And just one, one more thing I want to mention about this, and, and that is besides states being national models, the entities that make the most sense to be models are tribes, because tribes are sovereign. They're self-regulating entities. A tribe can pass regulation that says, we're going to have zero emission on all the wells on our reservation. Um, and that's the law. And if they do that, then this company you know, would be selling that um, equipment uh, to oil companies that are working on, on reservations. So that, that's something we were talking about this. We were talking with the Northern Ute, for example. Um, and it hasn't happened. Uh, Sure. For various reasons, but it's it's it needs to. And Darian, let's unpack that a little because there's a lot there. And when we uh, think about this, and and a buzzword that came up in some of the things you're saying are regulations. And I think this past spring, many people who have been watching just how regulations may have been rolled back, fluctuations, and and I want to go ahead and turn to Sunile because this often is the intersection where people turn to lawmakers, or uh, in your case, here in the city. And we heard earlier from the mayor initiatives and steps to think about this on a city level. But let's talk a little bit about how regulations come into play. And I think we also hear sometimes, too, that people in the industry feel that states are the ones who should be regulating some of this. So. Big um, question, but go ahead. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So number one, I would say that there is a lot that can be done without dealing with the federal government. Um, obviously, right now the political climate is such that I'm not going to expect a lot of, out of EPA, and and regulations are being rolled back. Um, but it doesn't mean that there's not a lot we can do. I mean, in New Mexico, we've got about 13 million acres of subsurface uh, land at the state. That's tantamount to what the feds have. Um, so we have a, a, a tremendous opportunity at the state level to actually drive change whether or not the feds are, are willing to move. Um, and a couple of just concrete examples. So one, I, you know, just doing what uh, Colorado did in terms of regulations is something that the governor could do tomorrow. I mean, it's it's not rocket science in terms of requiring um, more sensible regulations that capture, that track, you know, flaring, um, and, uh, and and requiring um, uh, that not to be wasted as a resource. Um, also, at the state land office. Uh, th there's a lot that can be done in terms of the land commissioner that really has tremendous authority over all of this, uh, you know, 13 million subsurface acres that we have. Um, and in that respect, you can do a lot in terms of, uh, you know, pushing back to deal with the pipelines that are leaking, uh, also requiring less waste in terms of uh, the activities that occur on state trust land. Uh, but also, the legislature really needs to act. Um, we have a statutory lease in New Mexico uh, on state trust lands that essentially incentivizes waste and uh, limits the ability of the land commissioner to really wrap in that industry and ensure that there isn't waste. So there's some very concrete items that we can um, uh, tackle 
uh, that, that whether or not the feds are, are acting, that, that we can still do uh, locally. Thank you for that. And Kent, I want to turn to you, just reading some of the material coming from ECHO and the different stances that they have taken with the possibility of rollbacks on rules and regulations on venting and flaring. And talk to me a little bit more about what you see in terms when we see fluctuations of, uh, of rules and regulations on some of this, how ECHO is bringing more voice to how you feel it's going to affect not only the environment, but communities. Well, I think our communities have, have stated this, that we, we, we don't like the waste. It's, it's affecting our children and education, health. It's possibly affecting water, which is sacred to us, like it is to most people, I think. And I think that some of the comments that just get, like Darren said about, there, this is, there's technology there to, to handle this. We know that. Um, it's a matter of them doing it. We've had some industry people, Exxon in the Permian Basin, I believe, has voluntarily started implementing some of this. Maybe they see the writing on the wall or something, but they're doing it. It can happen, and it can happen and still maintain jobs and, and produce money for the state. But we're seeing resistance up in the San Juan. I don't know why. We passed a methane rule. And uh, with their input and stuff, and, and looking at Colorado and other states like Wyoming, there's a possibility we can do this. They have sued nationally to, to stop that rule, I think, four times. I think we've won three, and we lost the last case and stuff like that. And that's a, a lot of people working on this. So if we had the will as a, as a people, as citizens of New Mexico, you could see the tribes, the state, you know, the industry, if we have a will, we can do this. We can stop wasting it. We can stop it affecting our children. We can, we can have clean air and clean water, and we can have jobs. You know, we can have money from the resource. And, and I think we can do it. We just all work together on this. I, and by the way, I like Kalu's statement about bringing them to the table, too, because they, they have been here before and talked. And I think that's important that we need to have this conversation. All right, thank you for that. And Phoebe, when uh, Darian was talking a little, talking about tribes uh, being that possibility or that place where we can see good models, you work directly with tribes and, and you uh, gracefully painted, you see it uh, many different ways. And sometimes people are still in discussions of whether they should develop or not. But when we think of tribes as possibly being the leader to give a model, what's your reaction to that? I think absolutely. We're, um, we have to also remember this land is Pueblo, Navajo country, Apache country. Um, the Pueblos have sustained, we're in our third government. <laughs> and so we've absolutely demonstrated resiliency in this landscape. And in, in terms of being that role model and that mentor, um, I think absolutely tribes can set an example that others can, can stand behind and start to follow. Um, one of the things that I think is um, really interesting about this topic, and again, it depends on the priorities of the tribe. Every tribe here in New Mexico has tribal sovereignty. And I see, I work with tribes that are very progressive in terms of economic development and willing to take and, and willing to make those hard decisions to maybe do um, drilling, fracking. Um, I work with tribes that are very traditional who firmly believe that to drill is hurting the Mother Earth and firmly believe that if we start to drill, we are disrupting the balance, which disrupts and reduces the potential sustainability within the landscape that we've been provided. Um, and so back to your question is, I think tribes can be that role model, even on the economic side. If, for, um, as Darian was saying, those tribes that do develop and start to produce oil and gas, but they do it with that core concepts in, uh, in terms of stewardship and resiliency for their people. And as well as those tribes that don't want to do it, 
can they, I'm working with a couple to develop regulations that are very strict so that generations of tribal councils to come will have a document in hand and know what the former tribal councils decided upon and why they decided upon that. Um, as an example, um, which is actually a, a clean energy for Coach de Pueblo, uh, when the dam was built, there was many proposals by companies to install hydroelectric at the dam, which is clean energy. But because of what is at that particular location and the sacredness of that particular area, the tribal council decided to not do hydroelectric at the dam. And in fact, worked almost a decade to pass a law at the congressional level to say that there should not be hydroelectric at the dam. And so it was that decision our elders made in the 1980s, and guess what, we revisited it in 2014, where there was a lot of effort to start to examine whether hydroelectric was good or was a potential at that location. And what I had to do on, as a request from the governor was pull out all the documents, pull out all the depositions, pull out all the language as to why the tribal council decided not to do hydroelectric at that particular location and provide it to the younger councilmen the 30-year-old councilman, the 40-year-old councilman, and when they read it, their, their mouths dropped open, and when they were asked again, do you support this, they all said no, because they knew why and fully understood why the elders said no. So, long story, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the many, the, the large spectrum. And it's really an exciting time to be thinking about all of these things, and it seems that each time we take a look at a different chapter coming out of Unearthed, something is happening in the news that directly relates to what the people are talking about. And um, I want to turn to you, Phoebe, again. Currently, we are seeing discussions about the reorganization of the Department of Interior. And is it even possible to think of some of these things with possible changes? Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion as to just exactly what the reorganization is going to mean, not only for tribal communities, but for states and um, leasing and decisions there. And so as you see change coming, even in the way that things are organized, can we still be thinking of these? Or is it time to start other dialogues that are connected to it? I think absolutely it's time to continue to work on these efforts um, because the pendulum's going to swing back at some point. And just like climate change, there's this up and down, up and down. That's the same thing that we see um, with governments and with policy. And even the general public, we start to swing the pendulum a little bit to the left and then it, whoop, we go back to the right. So right now, as we start to swing, um, or as we start to see the pendulum swing, maybe in this case to the right, we gotta continue to work because we have to be prepared when the opportunity arises, when we can implement what we've really thought about and planned for and looked at and made decisions on um, so that when we see that opportunity and that pendulum swinging back, whether it's oh, okay, now we, at the state government level, can we start implementing better regulations? And here we've got all, we've done the homework already. We've got to do the homework now, even, even with that thought of the potential of change down, down the road. We've got to continue to do our homework. And so I, I really advocate a lot with the tribal leadership when, it looks like the horizon looks bad and um, you know all these obstacles or challenges in the way continue to do your homework because there's going to be that opportunity in the near future and maybe in the far future um, to make change happen and in the long-term benefit of the people 
Okay. And I want to share with you, just talking a little bit about uh, the reorganization with the Department of Interior, and it kind of applies to many of the different things that we're talking about. Uh, this is a quote from the U.S. Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke from the Bismarck Tribune. He said, I don't think the government should be in a position to be adversary. We have to, as Interior, be a better partner. We have to work with industry. And he said this as he delivered a keynote speech at the Williston Basin Petroleum Conference in Bismarck in May. And so just any thoughts from the panel? And uh, I do want to let folks know who um, maybe are finding this in our podcast and are just tuning in, we are welcoming in a panel of guests to give us a variety of thoughts and insight into some of this. My name is Tara Gatewood, and I want to go ahead and turn it to Kent. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that uh, we've we've not been adversaries. I would say with um, our public lands, with with uh, the oil and gas, but there are some places that that uh, have greater value that shouldn't that shouldn't be drilled or mined, uh, and that's why we set those places apart. Uh, I'm I'm a wildlife conservationist, and uh, I know that there's some places where the deer come down, like off the Rome Mesa in Colorado, or or uh, some of the mesas in Colorado that come down to New Mexico, and that's their way of living. When, when we have heavy storms, they come down. We have areas where they breed, where the elk breed. They don't like to be disturbed. Those places should be sacred during certain times. We should not allow industry to, if, if we're gonna lose our wildlife, we lose an industry as well. Uh, we have an outdoor industry here. Of, it's $9.9 .9 million in New Mexico. It's a billion dollars. It's, it's $800 billion nationally or something. And you endanger things like that. We, a lot of people come here because it is the land of the Chattanooga. It's beautiful. We have, you, I think you saw in the films that David did and, and Kyle did that they're, they're, it's gorgeous. We have wildlife, and, and that's a great thing that we need to hold on to. And, so I don't think we are adversarial. We need to maintain certain places. Industry, I think, has a way of drilling. We talked about those laterally drilling, or you know, from one place. That that's great, I think, because that protects, keeps the fragmentation of habitat to a minimum. If they do it wisely, we can work together. We can live together. We can have. If we close the roads after we've, you saw some of those pictures where they had like a checkerboard of wells and a zillion roads. If we maintain it just so we have one road with feeders or we drill laterally and we do a lot of things, we can, we can have everything. We can have the, the, the mountains, the clean air, the wildlife, and we can have in industry working there. All right, thank you. Sunil, anything to add on the Secretary's comments? So I think the notion that we are somehow adversarial to the oil and gas industry is just absolutely uh, preposterous. Um, I would love to have adversaries that give us, um, that would give me hundreds of million dollars in you know, subsidies that uh, don't change your conduct at all. Um, you know, I, I remember um, some years back, uh, the big five oil companies were testifying before um, uh, the Senate uh, Energy Committee. And a simple question was asked. If we get rid of these uh, tax incentives, will you change, that are subsidizing our activities, will you change your behavior? And they said, no, we'll continue to drill and do exactly what we've been doing. Um, so we're giving those subsidies at the federal level. We're giving the subsidies at the state level. Um, you know, we are uh, giving away through waste or subsidized royalty rates um, across the board. So. Uh, you know, the notion that we have been tough on oil and gas uh, is just uh, is an interesting take on um, uh, on a reality that I don't think exists. But. And Sister Joan, I'm, I'm reading a little bit of dialogue on your face. Um, any comments? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm thinking is, um, you know, there are many people in this country who are of a faith tradition, or certainly people of faith and conscience, if they are not part of a, a particular church, and think, oh, where do they leave those values, those ethics, that morality? 
um, when they walk outside of their mosque or temple or church or meeting house because it, it feels like there's just um, sometimes like this comment left those values someplace else and they're not translated into business in an ethical way. It's like a misinterpretation that people often have of the book of Genesis, that we are to have dominion over everything, when actually the interpretation of that particular passage is we are to be gardeners of the garden, caretakers, caretakers of all that we have been given in the natural world. And I, I just love what you were talking about, um, how you you were discerning again and again with um, the, the community and your problem and the elders. And, and that's what we need to be about, I think, is this kind of discernment. And when you mentioned um, th this business, I was I just felt so sad that this business is doing the right thing and it's not making any money. And I'm thinking that's a very good example of this uh, economic ecology. It's taking everything into consideration in an ethical, moral sense and saying, how can we do the right thing for the common good? knowing the complexities and the limitations that we have. And um, we, we have to be living those things out in our hearts and in our business practices and in our families and communities. Thank you for that. And we can start taking uh, questions from the audience. And if, does anybody have a question now? Start right here. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Dodie Hawkins. And my question is, it seems so obvious that to capture uh, the leaks and flares, and the, I mean, it just, why not? And, and Darian, you said that the oil and gas industry like to do things their way. Well, I mean, wouldn't they benefit? I mean, my understanding is that they would make a lot more money because they would have more product. I, I simply cannot understand the resistance of the industry. So yeah, let me respond in, um, in a couple of different ways. Um, one thing I want to mention is that one of the people that's not here on this panel, and I think it's kind of an oversight, is someone from the industry, an oil and gas person. Um, I think you know they need to be here. I'm certainly not a technical. I don't know you know technical um, uh, information about this industry and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and at the same time, I think we need to recognize. Uh, where industry does play a constructive role. For example, right now, the largest investors in renewable energy in the world are your oil companies, your big oil companies. And they realize that oil is not in the future. And so they're diversifying. And so that kind of stuff needs to be recognized. Um, and um, I think, you know, it's, it's, your, it's probably your, your, a lot of, well, you know, I, I, I can't say, but a lot of your smaller companies, um, you know, they, they're just used to doing things a certain way. They figured out all their profit margins a certain way. They've done things that way forever. And it's hard for industry people sometimes to change, which is why regulation, and not just regulation, but smart regulation is important. And I believe, and, and my experience with uh, doing this business plan kind of bears it out, that there is regulation that's win-win. It's a win for industry, it's a win for the environment, it's a win for people, it's a win for the state. Um, and you know, because of my experience working, for example, with Coda Holding, I think that tribes can be a laboratory, potentially, for that kind of regulation and, and show that it can work. Tribes can make more money, they can protect the environment, and, and, and so those things have to happen. Um, uh, so that's hopefully the direction that we're, we're going. Okay, thanks. We'll go ahead and go with uh, another question. I wanted to ask the gentleman in the end here, um, given, if you were given that the fracking industry were using um, very safe chemicals and the safest process and uh, for our water and so forth, would you not still be worried about earthquakes? How do you feel about that? Well, I think that, that it's been shown when we have a certain density of fracking that you do have earthquakes. 
again, if you don't have that intense density like that, and if you're, and I'm not a driller, and I'm not an industry person, but I know that, that if, they, if they do it right, you don't have that problem. It's when they, they, they do some of those grid patterns like they did in Oklahoma and in southwest Texas where there's just intense fracking, intense drilling that you're starting to see those type of things. So you, there's another point for industry. They said that they could not do some of this. We had an industry person at one of the kind of things. He said because they lose a lot of orphan wells which are not on the pipeline. They have to truck their, their product in. And, and uh, but the fact is, it's not economic for them. It's barely economical right now to do that. So that was one of the things they were saying that they would lose. And I see these are all balances. I think that we need to balance. I think the value of, of our wildlife, our lands, our air, our clean water, no earthquakes for our houses. Yet yeah, you know these are things we need to balance. We can have this industry. We can have all these things if we do it right and we work together. Thank you. Any more questions, Terry? Can I? Can I? Please do. Can I address? So um, I've been working on the citizens working group for Sandoval County for an oil and gas ordinance for the entire county for the unincorporated areas on private lands, and um, I've learned a lot. So my background is environmental engineering, but I've learned a great deal working on this. And one of the things in terms of earthquakes that I've learned is it's not actually the process of fracking, the vertical and horizontal fracking, yeah, and they do create small explosions, but it is actually the the wells going back in of the re-injection of the water, the dirty water that's produced from the fracking process, that actually, that's where the earthquakes and a, a majority of them, that's the cause of those earthquakes. So if we, again, understand the process, so if injecting, having injection wells in uh, maybe a very sensitive geologic area may minimize the potential or reduce the potential of earthquakes down the line, that can be one bargaining chip or one thing that we can look at. So maybe in a highly fractured area, you don't want to have injection wells because that will promote earthquakes, as an example. Thank you. Any more questions? And, OK. Um, this is to anyone that wants to answer. Um, I'm just, my concern is the, uh, we've talked about transition and, and good things are happening and there can be more um, cooperation between different sides and eliminating polarization. But my concern is the rate of change in the environment versus our ability to have a rate of change in the way we look at everything, look at things. And that's, I guess it's kind of a question. Anybody like to take that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Uh, the scary thing is that we may have already reached the tipping point. Um, it may be too late, um, but uh, I think that there's, there, there's and this is all my personal opinion, there's so much at stake um, that we, you know, we can't stop trying, uh, especially in the current environment, you know, to, to move in the direction towards protecting the environment and towards mitigating climate change. And I think we're missing a big, big opportunity right now because climate change is a universal earth movement that affects everyone on the whole planet. And climate, the, you know, the, 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 the working to mitigate climate change is a force that can bring everyone, countries, you know, whatever political persuasion you, you, you have, it can bring everyone together and unite people in a common cause. I mean, when 9-11 happened, this country was more united than ever. Um, you know, we, we just had a, uh, not too long ago, a uh, economic development uh, conference in Farmington because of the, the issues, the economic issues and, that are going on and the, and the price of uh, oil and gas and so forth. And, and um, we brought some people in from, uh, uh, I think they were from Minnesota. And one of the things that they said is that an economic crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I want to make, uh, <laughs> want, want to modify that a little bit and say an ecological crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And right now, we're wasting it. 
Thank you. Sister Joan, you have something? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so it's an excellent question. And um, you speak of an economic crisis, you're speaking of a climate crisis. And uh, a number of years ago, I think it was John Paul II, the Pope, said, we are not in a climate crisis, we're in a spiritual crisis, a soul crisis. And actually, uh, on Care of Our Common Home, that encyclical, it really is talking about, ultimately, what does it mean to be a human being right now, living on this planet? And we can have <clears throat> technological solutions, interfaith power and light. We work on solar and energy efficiency and all these things. But the ultimate thing, I think, is looking into our own um, persons, our own humanity, our own souls, individually and collectively. And what is the meaning of our lives? What are we called to do? How are we called to do it? And there's no quick fixes. And we, this is a huge, huge uh, transitional moment for us, I believe, in our consciousness and in, in who we are and who we're guiding our children to be. A little story. We, this um, summer we have a summer intern. And she's a, a wonderful uh, woman who is uh, going to be a senior in college. And she is of no religious tradition or background. She's been very concerned about climate change. She's been working uh, with environmental groups and things on this. But she wanted to work with us, and she's thinking possibly she's discerning if she wants to study religion and ecology, because she sees this is not just an issue, and it's not doing this, um, this action or this petition or this, but there has to be some deep worldview shifts and changes in who we are. And so I, I, that engages all of us, I think, at a, a very deep and a new level, and us collectively and together, all of us as one in our diversity, to really uh, work together and to inspire one another and to be hopeful and come up with very creative, undreamed of um, solutions that we haven't even thought of. But we have to uh, draw from this deep place um, and with many, many diverse voices in order for that to happen. So I'm certainly hearing that dialogue is a solution and a way to address some of this. A lot of times people also turn to renewables. And uh, Darian, is there anything you can share about thinking of that as a solution? Well, renewables are obviously part of the solution. Um, they're not the whole solution. Um, you know, People talk about, um, well, let's just you know, uh, stop oil and gas industry and, and, and use solar and, and wind for generation and so forth. And uh, you can't. Um, you know, solar and wind are intermittent sources of energy. Um, you need to have energy 24-7. Um, so they can't fulfill that demand. And they also don't provide the amount of jobs that uh, oil and gas, for example, does provide. Saying that, though, um, uh, I think a lot of the answer is technology. Um, you know, uh, people are working on battery storage right now to make renewable energy uh, more robust. And um, there's, uh, you know, th there's there's new sources of energy. I'm, I'm trying to think. There's a, there's amazing sources of energy that are kind of uh, being thought of or being experimented with. You know, from from the uh, What's what's the uh, when you duplicate the the uh, the, so, the solar um, uh, I forget the term but you use, you use like this huh fusion fusion yeah that that's people are working on fusion people are working on I mean there's wave energy there's uh, uh, there's there's so it's 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 a big field and and so you know this this country right now should be. Government, I, I kind of believe in, in government industrial policy, you know. So I think the, the United States is, is retreating from that, but um, energy is an area that the government needs to be investing in, not, not hands off, but uh, encouraging and, and encouraging the development. And, um, and unfortunately, right now we're not. And I, I think that that's, that's part of, you know, the answer is going to come from many, many sources. All right, thank you for that, Darian. It looks like we're about a minute before wrapping up our discussion here in podcast, but Kent, any thoughts and, and furthering the discussion on solutions? Oh, 
Okay. I was just going to answer your question again, too. I think it has gone too far as far as uh, climate change and stuff like that. But nature is resilient. And shouldn't we be the same? Aren't we part of nature? We shouldn't give up. And we're, lo we're looking at losing 50% of all the species in the world, wildlife species. And, and we, need, we need to work on all these things as part of nature to stop that. So we shouldn't give up. No matter where we're at now, we've gone too far, we shouldn't give up. Thank you. And um, one more question. OK, we'll be able to take some more in just a moment. But that's going to go ahead and conclude our podcast. I do appreciate our panel here, also Kabu, for providing the space for this dialogue. More chapters will be available as we continue. Uh, the next one that is coming up uh, includes living with oil and gas in the San Juan Basin coming out uh, in July. And another one coming up is living with oil and gas in the Permian Basin. Thank you very much for tuning in and being here too.